Hello again. So we're back to the Lacrimal Land part two. So that was the nice slide we just looked at, wasn't it? You're all nice slides. I'm like incredibly enthusiastic about the slides 110% of the time. 30 years you know it's just kind yeah. of if ever you get tired of ophthalmology i can recommend that histopathology is a really good choice i do often question why i didn't do something like that <laughs> okay i think we're all back yay my turn go okay so let's find the slide. All right, I have to monitor chat. Type yeah. away, put your burning questions right. and uncertainties into the box, or you can interject at the appropriate moment. Yep, and the appropriate moment is pretty much any time. I'm just opening up the slide here. Sort of ask your questions, low power questions and then high power questions. Sharing the screen. In the, in the mode of thinking low power first and then high power. We are with a nice low power view. I think I got the impression it was quite hard for people to um, work out what was happening when they first saw this. But yes, but the, the pattern is one that's really characteristic, and pathologists look at this and go, "Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay." We go, "Oh," because what we recognise are these little round, little round cannonball things, you know. Yes, but the tricky bit is. What is the tissue? Where are we? Because we meant to identify the normal first, but we've fallen into the abnormal first. We have. <laughs> because yeah. it's most prominent. <laughs> it is. So. But the, where, where we are gives us a clue as to what the whole disease process might be. Right. Is anyone asking questions? Yes. So, um, no, there are adenoid cystic questions. Also. <laughs> okay. So it, 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 You've from, answered my question with that it's difficult to know what tissue it is. From, from this low power, because, you know, realistically, with all that blue stuff, it could have been a lymph node. And we only actually realise um, when we move slightly higher in power that maybe we're seeing ducts. So we start seeing ducts. Yeah. So are they normal or abnormal ducts? We had either, abnormal either. ducts. So the, the, the ducts are normal, the, the asini in between are really atrophic. There's very few asini left and mainly ducts left. And then we start seeing two things. We start seeing these little dotty blue cells and we've learned that in general, little dotty blue cells are lymphocytes. And then these, these round areas here, which I think everyone worked out were granulomas. Sorry, this is my mouse misbehaving. And then everyone mm. went hunting for giant cells. So, um, Amanda, if there's no oh. giant cells, would you still call this a granulomatous reaction? Without giant cells? Mm. Um, yep, all I need is epithelioid histiocytes. That's right. Uh, quite often we see granulomatous reactions without giant cells. Yeah, I think there's one just above your mouse yes, cursor there. Right yes, there. There's a nice <laughs> giant cell just there. Okay, so uh, sarcoid granulomas, uh, sometimes called naked granulomas because they don't have that palisading around them. They just sit there in the sea of lymphocytes with very occasional uh, giant cells here. So epithelioid histiocytes, occasional giant cells, and lymphocytes kind of scattered around the outside. So these are non-caseating granulomas. What's um, the difference between caseating and necrotizing? Ah, good question, Amanda. And it might be that I just have a very quick PowerPoint presentation on exactly that. So would you? <laughs> oh, she didn't even honest. set that one up. No, <laughs> I just think it's good to get your terminology right and your definitions right, so that you yes. so have the we'll same mental, the, um, mental image. Class drive here, uh, which I hope you can all exercise. Uh, um, go right. Types of granulomatous inflammation <laughs> by me. Here we go. Right. So. Um, types of inflammation right so a granuloma is epithelioid histiocytes and it's completely different to granulation tissue all right granulation tissue is to do with blood vessels 
and granulomas are to do with epithelioid histiocytes. And this is the diagram I was looking for you here. So we divide granulomatous information into ne necrotizing, are you with necrosis, and non-necrotizing. So the common non-necrotizing granulomas that we see around the eye are sarcoidosis, foreign body, which includes chalasium because the foreign material is the meibomian secretion, and then in sympathizing ophthalmitis. So okay. the location is important because that'll help you tell the difference between whether chalasion is reasonable or not. Yeah. Uh, so necrotizing, we, there's two kinds of necrosis. There's what we call caseating, which is the typical TB nut type necrosis. And that's smooth and clean and just maybe has some very shadowy cells in it. And that generally means TB. And then there's dirty necrosis. So dirty necrosis is full of blue dots that are broken down cells. And dirty necrosis happens with fungal infections and connective tissue diseases. What else do I have? So etiology, or right, I've got some pictures here. Right, so uh, this, is a, this is TB and it does have some caseous necrosis in the middle, though we can't see it very well on mm. this picture actually. Uh, atypical mycobacterium. So fungal, fungal granulomas have a ton of neutrophils on the inside of them. So the epithelioid histiocytes are confined to the outside and we've got a bunch of neutrophils in the middle. So that's typical for a fungal granuloma. And of course, in sympathizing ophthalmitis, we get these non-necrotizing granulomas in the choroid, but in particular along Brooks membrane. This is a typical naked sarcoid granuloma that we've just been seeing. This is a chalasian. This is such a bad picture. Um, usually they have this big blob of uh, meibomian lipid in the middle surrounded by um, the granulomatous reaction. Okay, so that was a very quick expedition into um, granulomas. That's the difference between necrotizing and non-necrotizing and uh, caseating and... Um, okay, yeah. another question. What makes an epithelioid histiocyte an epithelioid histiocyte? Hmm. What, right. what is an epithelioid histiocyte? Why isn't it an epithelial cell? This all is epithelioid epithelial. It's very confusing. So uh, an epithelioid thing is something that looks like epithelium but isn't. So what constitutes an epithelial cell that makes it so characteristic? It's got a nucleus surrounded by copious, often eosinophilic cytoplasm. Think of epithelioid cells in melanoma. So here we've got uh, this inflammatory cell. This. Can uh, you make it full screen? Yeah, I will. This monocyte lineage cell. Remember these are circulating monocytes that go live in tissue. Um, uh, has decided that it's going to change its job. So it's going to change its job and sit in tissue and be a histiocyte and accumulate lots and lots of cytoplasm with a nucleus in the middle that makes it epithelioid. And the job of the histiocyte is to uh, pump out cytokines. And sometimes it goes further down its uh, job line and becomes a macrophage, which is the same cell line that's changed its job into something that phagocytoses stuff. So they're all the same cell with different jobs. All right, more questions. Is discrete, diffuse and zonal? How would you break down the different types of granuloma or necrotizing versus non-necrotizing. This seems to get a lot of airtime in previous registrar notes. Okay. So I guess, hmm. yeah. So I'd call these discrete granulomas. Would you call that? They, they look quite good to me. They're coalescing. The top two look like they're a bit coalescing, coalescing. though. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, zonal granulomas. So often when we think about the necrotizing granulomas, what they have is a central area of necrosis, followed by palisaded histiocytes followed by an outer layer of lymphocytes, okay? So they have distinct layers of reaction. Like also the rheumatoid granulomas would look like that. Yeah, too. that's the same as well. They have the central collagen necrosis with the palisaded fibroblasts and histiocytes, and then on the outside of that, lymphocytes. I think this is this field here is a really good one to stick into your memory banks <laughs> as a non-necrotizing discrete granulomas. Would you zoom in on an epithelioid histiocyte? 
I will see if my mouse will get me get there. That's as close as I can get. And yes, we are coming back. Here we go. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So we can see that they've got like oval to kidney shaped nuclei and their cytoplasm is indistinct from one another. How come that doesn't mean it's one enormous giant cell? Mm, because it's not actually, it's, it's, it looks indistinct, but isn't actually <laughs> indistinct. Yeah. I was always told the nuclei of epithelioid histiocytes look like if you're walking along the beach in bare feet, these, no, in, in your, in your like tennis shoes, this is the footprint shape of the tennis shoe yeah, that's um, right. on the wet sand on the beach. Okay. Anything else from this lovely sarcoid in the lacrimal gland? And sorry, to, sorry to be uh, slow. <laughs> Would you just point with your cursor at a couple of them? So I can... Right. So this is a nucleus of yep. one. Yeah. This one. Okay. Okay. There. Yeah. Got it. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Mm -hmm. And for Cam's question, I think that um, diagram of the necrotizing, non-necrotizing in your lecture is the perfect one to stick in your memory bank so that you can just produce a differential diagnosis that's required. Mm. Okay, are we done with this slide? I think so. I will stop sharing it and we will go on and look at the last slide for today, which is, uh, would you like to give a clinical history, Amanda? Yes, I think we'd better. Um, yeah. So the clinical history of the last slide, Rose I, second slide there, um, this will be a two and a half year old child with a painless mass in the eyelid that the parents have noticed growing over the last two and a half months. It has not responded to antibiotics and there's been no history of trauma. Okay, record. Okay, here we go. So we just looked at that eyelid from a child and um, it's a good example of having, uh, if your knowledge is kind of structured by a framework, it's a good way to approach it, isn't it? Otherwise, you're just completely at sea from this, <laughs> this thing. Um, so it's a tumour that we know is in the eyelid in a child and is composed of very, very malignant looking pleomorphic cells. So that immediately brings our differential diagnosis down because there's relatively few tumours that occur in the eyelids of children that are horribly malignant, just horrible. Oh. And I mentioned them earlier in her talk. Hmm. So already mentioned, we're doing a retrieval practice now <laughs> and applied learning. So. so John suggested rhabdo. What's the, other, what's the other differential diagnosis? Yeah, put in, put in your things. Not rhabdo again, something else. Because you can't actually tell. So, uh, go on. It's neuroblastoma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Neuroblastoma. And something else, something else. Come on, another one. Another sort of blue malignity things in... Uh, uh, lymphoma? Yeah, they're all good. Good suggestions, everyone. Lymphoma, metastatic neuroblastoma, and a rhabdomyosarcoma. They'd be not pretty good as well. Oh, medulloblastoma. Yeah. Uh, Juliana has said that medulloblastoma. That, does that occur in the orbit? I only know it from the brain, really, and the mm, eye. Goodness, if it got out into your eyelid, I think you'd be dead. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah, so I, think, I think we'll stick with rhabdo lymphoma. And, um, so location specific, but yes, it is a blue cell tumour <laughs> of children. <laughs> should, I, should I share the screen? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go and talk? Great. Talk. Okay, and so I will monitor. Go a bit here. All right, so ask questions. Right, so just trying to get low power. Right, so this this was uh, something where we could recognise skin. Okay, so uh, skin over the top here, and in fact, skin along here. There were little um, little skin adnexy down here, and I think it slipped into conge about mm. here. So we've got the interface in the lid between skin and and conge. And then we've got this large tumor here, which has got an infiltrative margin. So if we, we look up here, we can see it's not well circumscribed. We've got the streams of cells going off here and um, it's very blue. 
um, and worryingly there might be some areas possibly of necrosis that I can see at this power. So an infiltrative, very blue tumour. Um, while, while we're on the low power thing and the normal yeah. thing, um, can you show us, um, how do you know it's the eyelid? Because the eyelid should have some skeletal muscle in it. Yeah. Where's that? Yeah, so uh, I think that that's been subsumed by the tumour. It's I think a little bit up the top there. A little there. bit yeah. the top here, yeah. But the rest yeah. of it has been eaten up. So if this is the eyelid, where are the meibomium glands in the tarsal plate gone? Mm. Mm. So let's have a look. So, um, so we've still got... Let's go around the edge here. So around here, we've still got ordinary sebaceous glands and keratinizing epithelium through here. And through here, we've still got sebaceous glands. So they've all gone as well, really, haven't they? It's a big they've, clue, isn't it? it? Yeah, they've just been taken over. The nature of this tumour. Around here, we've just got conj because we've got no mm. more... Um, mm epithelial cells left. So it's pleomorphic and hyperchromatic and mitotically active. And in places it's got a vaguely spindle celled look. And I think I found one rhabdoid cell. Um, but really the differential diagnosis with this is in immunohistochemistry. We would always do immunohistochemistry and genetics on any pediatric so Diane, if you got this as a frozen section, what would you say? You can't I would do it. Say, I would say that this was a malignant tumour and uh, final diagnosis would be pending on further investigation. There's another question. If it's a rhabdomyosarcoma, how come it doesn't have skeletal muscle? How come it's not arising from skeletal muscle? Yeah, so um so that's a good histogenesis question. Rhabdomyosarcomas can arise from muscle, but can quite easily arise from kind of undifferentiated cells that differentiate down the rhabdoid line from, from, from anywhere. So can they arise in places that don't have any skeletal muscle? Yes, they can. because Like the are, orbit. <laughs> yeah, like the orbit, because there'll be stemish cells there and a cell goes bad and decides, oh, I think I'm going to express my uh, set of genes that contains muscle. So how do you know it's a rhabdomyosarcoma then? Well, we can do two things. We can look at the genes it expresses and we can also... Um, look at the proteins it expresses. And some of those are kind of the same things these days because we can look at um, proteins that are specific to muscle cells, um, but also we can look at some proteins that are produced by typical mutations that are present in tumors. So thinking about the roles of immunohistochemistry, um, the first and most obvious role that it's used commonly for is what we call histogenesis, which is determining the cell of origin or the line of differentiation. And so um, we, we might want to rule out melanoma on this and do an S100, for example. In an adult. In an adult, yeah. Or we might want to confirm it's uh, showing muscle markers by looking at you know, myosin stains or desmin stains or, or actin stains. Um, we might want to investigate whether or not it's showing any neural markers by doing the stains for, for neuroblastoma on this. What about lymphoma? I would definitely check that these are not lymphoma cells. So I would do a small panel to start with, looking at histogenesis with some muscle markers in, some neural markers in, some lymphoma markers in, um, and probably actually... Um, uh, probably actually a cytokeratin, just in case it wasn't some weird as kind of, I know it wasn't on our list. But so you I, mean you can't tell if it's a, a lymphoma, a um, sarcoma, or a neuroblastoma? Correct. I could have a bit of a guess from its morphology, probably quite an informed guess, but I wouldn't want to bet this child's life without further evidence. Okay. It's good to know our limits on this. Yeah. So, mm. so I would stain for each of those differential diagnoses. 
And then once I'd honed down into a differential diagnosis, then I can do further stains that would inform the prognosis and the treatment, okay? Because immunohistochemistry these days is used for prognosis and treatment. And we saw it earlier in BAP1. So if BAP1 is lost in a choroidal melanoma, it will do worse, right? For treatment, um, if, the, if we have an, an eyelid melanoma, which this one isn't, and it's BRAF positive, then we can give a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. The, the first one that did this, of course, was breast with ERPR and HER2. So immunohistochemistry, histogenesis, treatment, and prognosis. So if this is a rhabdomyosarcoma, what, what can we do for differentiating prognostic yeah the, the one of the things. most important things that i would do would i would be send it off to the genetics lab what are we looking for we're looking for the typical mutations that you find in um embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma versus alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma because alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma does really really badly and needs to have the addition of chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy to its treatment protocol. Mm. I remember A for awful, which is alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. It's got translocation. B for botryoid and better, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And then this, a quick question. Sorry, this sounds stupid. You said this is obviously a very obvious feature of malignant cells. Just want to talk about that a little bit because we find we wouldn't catch you with the, what the nature of this mass was yeah so so the most important thing is to recognize that this is a, is malignant so from from yeah. low power we had an expansile infiltrative mass okay? destructive too yeah destro destroying the normal destructive infiltrative large mass in the eyelid and then um when we come down so that's the architecture. And then we come down to the cytology. These cells, they, they mm -hmm. are of different sizes and shapes. So they're pleomorphic. Mm -hmm. They uh, don't respect each other. They're overlapping. They're very dark blue because they've got a ton of, ton of chromatin in there. So they're hyperchromatic. And as we look around, we can spot mitoses. Now, they that there are some around that are moderately obvious like this one here see it looks like a bit of a squash mm. fly someone's got a fly and squashed it a little chromated legs are sticking out here and again i think i think i'm at maximum thingy. so diane I, how do you know that's a mitosis because i thought mitosis looked like this that yeah. looks like a w mm, <laughs> except see, that's probably a bit of a mitosis they do in normal cells eh? but these are abnormal cells so they've got too many chromosomes or too little and they form tri no instead of dividing in two they try and form tripolar stuff and they kind of go like go, go like this you know they're just mm. kind of bad mitoses yeah atypical mitoses atypical mitoses okay there's, there's a mitosis here that looks a bit more typical someone's got it's got little legs sticking out of it I thought they were apoptotic figures too, lots of them. Yeah, yeah, there are. So sometimes it's easy to confuse apoptotic figures and mitoses. They can look quite similar. That, so yeah, that cell is looking as if it's dying and undergoing apoptosis, which is why we only count the ones that have actually got little legs sticking out of them with another mitosis. Okay, any other questions in the chat or free form? So really, that was a slide about what to do when it's malignant and horrible. You, about yeah. differential diagnoses. Yeah. yeah, make a differential diagnosis and ask for intelligent staining. That's the part E or something of the question. If you get something like that, that will be of more importance. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so going back to uh, things for the day. So I've talked about... Um, IHC and genetics. Um, I've got a section here called um, lymphoma, what you really need to know. And the answer is not much. Um, it's how to tell reactive from lymphoma is what you really need to know. You need to be able to talk intelligently about 
reactive lymphoid proliferations versus a lymphoma, but you don't need to know the classification of lymphoma, how to tell one from the other, the genetics of lymphoma, or the immunohistochemistry of lymphoma. Um, I think that we should probably, it's nearly five o'clock, we should do the exit survey next. And if you are keen, then I can uh, do lymphoma after that. As part okay. Of yeah. So I'm just going to try and um, put the chat. So exit survey is in the um, chat. If you can click that, it'll take you four or five minutes. And then you can turn your screen off, go and do the exit survey, and then come back and we'll wrap up. That's it. Yep, so the exit survey helps us design the next session because it tells us what you need to know yep. for next time. So we appreciate a bit of thought going into that. We don't need a bottle of wine. We need an exit survey filled in for everything that we do. Login? I don't think so. I think you should no. just be able to go straight there. Um, and yeah, I don't think the University of Auckland website with a login. Yeah, it might let us access it. Oh, has oh, that got, got a problem? Okay, let me just go back. It shouldn't um, give you a barrier. Um, oh yeah, it goes to yeah. Oh, cool. sign in. You you fix that, and I'll yeah, talk and you about talk. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Lymphoma. What you really need to know. I will share the screen. Okay. So what you really need to know is to tell the difference between reactive and the low-grade mantle cell lymphoma, which is typical for the conjunctiva and the orbit. Of course, other lymphomas do occur in the orbit. Um, you get high-grade lymphomas there, um, but usually they're absolutely no problem at all to tell that they're malignant. I don't think you'll get questions on lymphoma because no one understands them except lymphoma pathologists. Okay, so this is a typical reactive pattern for a lymphoid proliferation. It's actually, it's actually in a lymph node, um, but what it shows here is that it's got lymphoid follicles in it. And the lymphoid follicle is characteristic of a reactive lymphoid proliferation. What happens in the lymphoid follicle is the cells um, present present antigens to each other and mature and go through a normal maturation process. What happens in lymphoma is the normal maturation process is completely disturbed. So while you get some follicles, for example, in follicular lymphoma, you don't get a true follicular pattern. So if you're looking, say, at follicular um, conjunctivitis, what you will get is a series of follicles sitting under the conjunctiva like this, and they're quite distinct and well differentiated. Inside a lymphoid follicle, so this is the edge of the lymphoid follicle here, okay? And this is the outside. It looks like a starry sky pattern, okay? And these starry bits here, what they are is macrophages with broken up cells in them. So they are eating the cells and processing the antigens. Oh, to Hello, sorry. Sorry. Maturing lymphocytes. Yes, you had a question? No? Okay, that's fine. So the outside, the, the nodule, and look for the starry sky pattern of these uh, macrophages. So these are called, they've got a special name, you don't have to remember it, but I just love it, tingible body macrophages. These are tingible bodies. Okay, and this is them up close. Don't do this. Don't look real up close. You'll get real scared if you look up close, okay? Because you will see mitoses and you will these, see these cells called centroblasts, which are the proliferating cells inside the lymphoid follicle. It's their job to proliferate and they look a bit cancery because they're big and they've got nucleoli. So just stay nice and far away like this. If you look at this lymphoid follicle again, you will notice that it's darker at one end and lighter at the other. And this is normal. You've got to think of it as a bit like a conveyor belt where we've got cells that are a bit like undifferentiated centroblasts, centrocytes here, 
haven't decided what they're going to do in life, get exposed to these macrophages with tingible bodies, and then go through here and form centroblasts and then produce lots and lots of immune cells and off they go in the world. So this is, uh, we describe these follicles as being polar. They've got a dark side and a light side, just like the force. And this is normal. All right. So mantle zone lymphomas don't have this. They are a C, a uniform sheet. I'm doing my force thing here. Uh, <laughs> you will remember that they are a uniform sea of cells. Okay, sometimes there's slightly bigger cells in them and there's definitely mitoses in them, but mostly they're made of little dark cells, but in a uniform sheet, right? A uniform sheet. Okay, so in malignant low-grade lymphomas like the malt lymphoma of the eyelid, you don't get reactive lymphoid follicles, just a sheet, whereas in reactive um, proliferations, you get lymphoid follicles. That is the simple take-home message. Questions? That's all you need to know about lymphoma. Okay, so let me summarize what you said. Um, if it's lymphoid follicles, it's reactive. And if it's a sheet of cells, a sea of cells that are all the same, it's a low-grade lymphoma. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, great. All you need to know about lymphoma. All right, have you got your link working, Amanda? Yes, I've got my link working. So this is the exit. It'll take about four minutes to do. Okay, Try that. Right. Excellent. So turn your screen off, concentrate, do it and then turn your screen back on when you've finished it so we know. That's good. I've got I've got all the responses. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. So there was a question here about. Um, uh, so Sam asked, you still have to do flow cytometry, though, right? So the, a point at which we choose to do flow cytometry is when the wet piece of tissue arrives in the lab and we don't know what it looks like. So we do. If you write query lymphoma, we do flow cytometry. Once it's on the slide and we're looking at it, it's too late. No flow. Okay, uh, I'm going to wrap up now. So thank you all for coming. It's been a big day, but I think that we achieved a lot. So I have another assignment for you. I'm going to share screen. Okay, so here you'll see assignment three. Uh, I've just posted it. Um, I've just posted it under the um, 10th of October. So here we go, assignment three. So in assignment three, what I have assigned you is 12 slides. So before you go oh, 12 slides, this is two slides a day, okay, for you to look at in pairs. And that means that every day this week for six days, you each get to describe one slide, okay? And we're doing this deliberately because we don't want you to lose these skills. We want you to reinforce these skills. And what we're going to do next week is we're going to go and have a look at all these slides and reinforce and feedback on all the things that you um, that you need to just keep on learning okay so assignment three in pairs look at two slides a day one each for the next six days i don't think there's anything else was there amanda um that sounds fine um i will Oh, can we just do, go through how to, so those people who prepared and answers today, your PowerPoints, 
how to put them into the Google Classroom and where to put them so that you can find each other's answers because this is the whole point is peer learning. So perhaps Diane, if you open up the Google Classroom again and show um, our participants how to link, if you go to the run sheet for today. Yep, run sheet for today. Yep, and open up that. I've made this um, anybody can edit. So if you link, so you gave a talk on whatever it is. Um, so Chris, yeah, how are you going to pretend you're Chris? How would you link your PowerPoint to that title? And just go up to the link icon in the toolbar there. So I think so, first you have to upload it to the web, don't you? Ah, uh, yes. So Chris, you have to put this into your Google Drive is the best way to do that. Pop it into Google Drive and then highlight the thing mm -hmm. and link. Link, and it'll give you the option. Paste your Google Drive. Oh, no, that won't work. You'll have to go back to, oh, it's upload, actually. Um, no, well, no, you've, you've got to upload it to your drive first and then link from your drive. And you can find it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Have a go at doing that. And have a go at doing assignment three. Now, Steve, who isn't here, uh, I know has been paired with... Uh, Big me. Jess. Jess. Yeah. So you may not be able to raise Steve because he might be like still in the maternity ward or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's okay. So would you like to just choose a three to join? I don't think Jubin is... Um... Oh, he hasn't turned up yet. Hmm. Jubin hasn't turned up either, so maybe we'll assign those two together. Yep. Yes. Um, and then everyone will have a partner. So Nishin and Jess then. Nishin yeah, and Jess. Jess. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Right. So I just had a question. Um, are we supposed to be calling our partners every day to do this? <laughs> or what like well, what are you so ideally, yes. Ideally you go, hey, let's let's spend um, you know, quarter of an hour zooming together every day. Um, just a problem with time zone differences between countries and work and things that might be a bit of an issue as well. You're grown up, so you'll sort it out. Yeah. Okay. You do your own scheduling. Yeah. And, and we're supposed to like write down our answers and present them or just... No, no, you don't have to write down your answers. So we're going to okay. do it like today where you're going to make a diagnosis and okay. then um, you're going to ask us questions about things that you want. But, you know, filling out and we will give particularly a low power introduction. So it's your areas of difficulty. It's not the textbook answer. We, we, we want to know what you don't know so we can help you. It's identifying your gaps, not telling us what you know. Yeah. Okay. I think that might be us. It is. And when do we meet again next Saturday? Uh, 11 o'clock New Zealand time. Mm -hmm. Nine o'clock Sydney time. Okay, 11 a.m. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you for doing the survey. Yeah. That's yeah. what we appreciate. <laughs> okay, thank bye, you. Everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Um, do you want to stop recording, Diane? Stop.